Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. James Charles Martin was born on the 3rd of January 1901 into Cumble, southern New South Wales, to Charles and Amelia Martin. He was the third of five children and the only son. His father was born Charles Marx in Auckland, New Zealand, but emigrated to Australia and changed the family name to avoid discrimination on account of being Jewish. The family would cross the border to Victoria sometime around 1906 and finally settled in Hawthorne, a suburb east of Melbourne, in 1910. And it's here that James, known to friends and family as Jimmy, would attend his schooling. Like most boys, he had an interest in the military and in particular, the fact that the cadet unit of the school was responsible for playing the drum that called the students to class. And thanks to the 1903 Defence Act, he was actually able to fulfil that interest by joining the junior cadets at the age of 12. And Martin, like so many boys of the time, wished to then join the senior cadets when he turned 18. Little did he know, he would not live to reach that age. As mentioned in earlier episodes, the 1903 Defence Act laid out the formation of a part-time militia and mandatory military service for all males of warfighting age between the ages of 12 and 29. This would provide a ready force that could be called up as required to defend Australia from foreign aggressors. The compulsory military service component of the Defence Act was activated in 1911 as the threat of war loomed on the horizon. And when war did finally break out in 1914, and with the excitement of the grand adventure being spoken about for close to a decade in prolific verse of defending king, country and the realm, men flocked to recruitment stations across the country to sign up. This left a lot of work that still needed to be done to keep the country functioning. And as a consequence, younger men, boys and women entered the workforce often for the first time. In January 1915, Jimmy moved to Maldon in regional Victoria and worked on a farm owned by his aunt and uncle. While there, he discovered that his father had been rejected enlistment on medical grounds, and as a result, Jimmy returned to Melbourne intending to take his father's place. Considering at the time the minimum age to enlist was 21 years, Jimmy was going to require the consent from his parents. Now this is completely ignoring the fact that he was also four years younger than the minimum allowed age to go to war as a soldier, even with that consent. While boys aged 14 to 17 could enlist as buglers, trumpeters, and musicians, they were traditionally kept as far away from the fighting as possible. For the Navy, however, it was common practice for boys to go to war and join at this age, serving as officers' attendants and officer cadets, with the intent being that it gave them better employment opportunities once they reached maturity. Understandably, his parents were not excited with the idea of their baby boy going to war, and it took him threatening to sign under another name and never write back. They finally relented and signed the permission slip on the 10th of April, 1915, stating that he's aged to be 18 years old. Permission slip. It makes it seem like he's going off to camp, not a global conflict. Two days later, Jimmy presented himself to the Melbourne Town Hall, consent form in hand, enlisted, and stated his age as 18. Disturbingly, when he was accepted, it was mentioned that he was, quote, the fittest specimen, unquote, that they had seen all day. After taking his oath and medical examination, he was assigned to the first reinforcements to the 21st Battalion. After initial training at the Broadmeadows camp, he would say farewell to his family one last time before departing aboard the troop ship HMAT Berrima on the 28th of June. Jimmy continued his training on arrival in Egypt and officially joined the 21st Battalion, and was assigned to the 4th Platoon. While also in Egypt, he noted that, quote, everything is desert and work, unquote, and would cross paths with Cecil James Hogan, a fellow boy soldier at the age of 16, and the two would become mates during their training. On the 27th of August, 1915, he wrote to his parents to say that he was packing up to go to the Dardanelles for the Gallipoli campaign to, quote, to have our share of the Turks, unquote, and left the following day aboard the troop ship Southland. On the 2nd of September 1915, the Southland was torpedoed by a German U-boat in the Aegean Sea, about 40 miles from the island of Lemnos. A subaltern on board later described the attack, quote, A sentry shouted, My God, a torpedo. We watched the line of death getting nearer until there came a crash and the old ship reeled, unquote. Jimmy was one of hundreds of soldiers who boarded lifeboats and waited hours for aid. The lifeboat that Jimmy was aboard capsized and he was stranded in the water for four hours. 
Almost all on board were successfully rescued and later continued their journey, arriving in Wardrose Bay, before departing to Gallipoli on the 7th of September, occupying positions near Wire Gully the following day. The men of the 21st Battalion quickly became accustomed to the horrible conditions in the trenches and constant gunfire. In October, Jimmy wrote home, detailing how conditions were on the peninsula, writing, quote, We have been in the trenches for about a month now, so we are more used to it. It is very quiet where we are, so we're not seeing much fun. Now and again, we give a few rounds rapid fire, and the artillery send a few extra shells. Don't worry about me, as I'm doing splendid over here, unquote. He also asked his family to, quote, write soon, as every letter is welcome here, unquote. He had apparently not received any mail since leaving Australia, despite writing home regularly, and called it, quote, very disheartening to see others getting letters from home and me not getting even one, unquote. Anecdotally, Jimmy became ill within hours of writing this letter, and delayed visiting the battalion's medical staff for two weeks. Inevitably, he collapsed, which forced him to the ambulance station, and on the 25th of October, 1915, he was evacuated to a hospital ship with typhoid fever. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, Private James Charles Jimmy Martin died of heart failure shortly afterwards at the age of 14 and 9 months. While he was alive, he was highly spoken of by others in his platoon. Sergeant Coates later said that he had, quote, never had a man in his platoon who paid more attention to his duty, unquote. He was buried at sea from hospital ship Glenart Castle, three months short of his 15th birthday, and he is commemorated on the Lone Pine Memorial in Gallipoli. The day after his death, Matron Reddock, a nurse who tried to save Jimmy, wrote a letter to his mother about her only son. It is said that his mother's hair went white overnight, and sadly his parents were divorced shortly afterwards. Now the question remains, how and why was a 14-year-old allowed to go off to serve in the First World War in the first place? Well, the main reason is that for the most of the 20th century, it was actually up to the government to prove who you were, as it wasn't common practice to issue birth certificates, and most people didn't have a form of ID on them, which meant that as long as you met the physical requirements and at least looked old enough to serve, a recruiter wasn't going to have any reason to suspect that the man standing before them was anything else. While it was difficult, it wasn't necessarily impossible to deceive a recruiter if the desire to serve was also strong enough. I previously mentioned two men who did just that. John Hines lied about his age and George Giles gave a fake name. And while some recruiters were very strict adherents to the enlistment criteria, there was more than a handful who turned the blind eye either voluntarily or with some fiscal encouragement. Now this resulted in the process of recruiter shopping, where those wishing to go to war would join men who were rejected for one reason or another to move around the districts in search for less strict recruiters or medical officers, usually changing their names or taking lodging in the local tavern, inn or bordello to fulfill this goal. Considering that Jimmy Martin met the physical requirements of enlistment at the age of 14 was primarily due to his upbringing and his pre-war vocations as a labourer. This meant that for boys like Jimmy Martin, as long as you were at least 5 foot 6, had a chest measurement of 34 inches and were of generally good health and at least had the appearance of being an adult, you weren't going to be challenged and the only way most of these boy soldiers were caught out was either due to self-disclosure while on the front lines or due to petitioning from concerned parents or employers. Though anecdotally, the units these kids were assigned to generally found out sooner rather than later and routinely reassigned them to less dangerous positions like runners and orderlies. Now, while boys could join as buglers, trumpeters, and musicians, many gave false ages in order to join as soldiers. And because of this, we may never know just how many signed up or how many were killed. Though, the Australian War Memorial has determined that at least 235 soldiers and sailors died before their 18th birthday in the Great War. In fact, Jimmy Martin potentially went ashore on board a lifeboat being oared by boy sailors. By all accounts, Jimmy Martin's reasoning for enlisting in the First World War was hearing that his father had been rejected on medical grounds. This was commonplace. Thousands of Australian men who otherwise would have been fit and healthy were rejected due to the intent of sending only the best of the best to help defend the mother country. This sadly had the side effect that meant that as we sent our best, 62,000 of our best would also pay the ultimate price. Now, as a teenager, he didn't have to serve. He could have stayed at home and worked on his relative's farm in safety, but that's possible that he thought that the sole male heir to his family that he had to serve in his father's place. Considering his interest in the military, he might have also seen this as the excuse to test the skills he had learned in the cadets, to travel the British Empire and earn a sizable wage for what was seen as a conflict that was supposed to end in Christmas 1914. In 1991, the British rock band Motorhead released their ninth studio album titled 1916. The titular track is about boy soldiers in the Great War. The song has since been covered by Sabaton and contains the lyrics, quote, We all volunteered, and we wrote down our names, and we added two years to our ages. 
eager for life and ahead of the game, ready for history's pages, unquote. Now, the boys featured in Lemmy's song are 16, not 14 like Jimmy, but it does touch on the same reasonings. At the turn of the century, Rudd Kipling, Arthur Conan Doyle, and Banjo Patterson spoke of the Anglo-Boer War in such terms that made it seem like a wholesome and noble pursuit filled with glory and honored sacrifice, that colored the opinions of an entire generation of soldiers to join the grand adventure, the chance to see the world fight on a continent during the campaign seasons and be home by the end of the year. And for boys who grew up at this time, it's not hard to see how they would have been swept up in the pomp and ceremony that had been associated with conflict in these early days. Whatever was his reason, James Charles Jimmy Martin answered his country's call to serve and sadly has the distinction of being the youngest Australian service person killed in war, a record that will hopefully never be broken. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.